Good morning, everybody. Welcome to New Life Baptist Church. So glad that you are here and with us this morning. It is great to be in the house of the Lord, ready to worship him. Aren't you glad that God's grace is amazing? Amen. I am so thankful for that. Let me ask that question again. I don't think we're together. Aren't you glad that God's grace is amazing? Amen. I'd like for us to start our service off this morning again in prayer. I just think we need the power of God upon our service. And I don't want to take for granted the fact that he's just going to give it without our asking. The Bible says, just as a father knoweth how to give good things unto his children, how much more does the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And so let's take some time this morning. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Let's ask God's um, for God's presence to be among us, for his power to be with us. Let's ask the Lord uh, to allow us to cast out uh, those things this morning that would hinder us from hearing God's word and to open up our hearts and minds to receive him. We need him, right? And so let's take some time this morning. You pray quietly, every one of us, go before God and say, Lord, I need to hear from you this morning. We want your power upon our service. Would you speak to us and bless us? Would you pray right now? Father, we need you this morning. Lord, your word says that your grace is sufficient for us, that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. That's why we're here today. Lord, we want you to strengthen us where we're weak. So we come before you right now with open hearts and minds to receive what you have for us today. Your people have gathered together. They've prayed. They've talked to you. They have asked you to fill them with your power and your spirit. So Lord, we, we plead with you to do that. Uh, help us to remove distractions this morning, to ready our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us. And then Lord, help us to grow from the power of your word. Father, I pray that you'd bless those who could not be here today. Touch them like Miss Bobby Johnson. Uh, Lord, struggling today, I pray that you would be with her and Gary and touch them in a special way. I'm sure, Lord, there are others this morning. So, so God, please move in our midst. Make yourself real to us as we worship you and praise you for who you are. Thank you so much for your amazing grace. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing this morning about God's wonderful and amazing grace. I want you to sing today like you believe it. I want to hear it this morning. God is an amazing God, full of mercy, full of goodness, full of praise. Let's sing about that this morning. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory. The King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth With holy thunder Who leaves us breathless In awe and wonder The King of glory The King above all kings Sing it out this morning This is amazing grace This is unfailing this morning. Let's continue to sing about that the amazing grace that he's shown. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations 
with its truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear amazing thought this morning. Grace that's greater than all the sins that we've, ever, that we've ever done. All the things that come to our mind when we think of wrongdoing. We've done those things, yet still, His grace is greater. His grace is more. That's the God that we serve. A God that extends grace, the very meaning of the word, to those who don't believe, or not to those who don't believe, but those who don't uh, deserve what it is that He's extending. Right. Amen. He's extending it to us. And it's not of our own, it's of his and his alone. He is the one who our hope 
is in. Our next song, Living Hope, talks about that idea. Sing with us. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name. and he is alive. He's sitting on the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. And that's who we serve. Once again, his grace is sufficient for all of our needs, for everything that we have, for even the sin that we've committed, his grace is still more. It's grace and grace alone that gives us hope to push forward, the grace of Jesus Christ himself. Our last song this morning, Grace Alone, sing with us.
supplies, strength unknown, He will provide. Christ in us, our cornerstone, we will go forth in grace alone. Every soul. Father, we're so thankful for your grace. We don't deserve any of it. Lord, there's nothing that we have done that merits us favor of any kind. It's all you. It's all yours. And Lord, we're so thankful that you extend it to us. Lord, be with our church today as we have many people here to, that have gathered together to worship your name, to fellowship together, and Lord, to learn. Uh, once again, as pastor comes before us this morning, fill him with your spirit. Help him to be able to speak your words to us today. Help us to become more like you each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Again, thank you so much for being in the house of God this morning. What a joy it is to see your faces here today. And uh, I hope that you had a wonderful time just now praising God, thanking him for who he is, remembering his amazing and wonderful grace. The, the idea of grace, uh, j just in itself, me gaining something that I don't deserve. It's just a beautiful thought. And, and what makes it more beautiful is when you recognize that you don't deserve anything at all. And so getting something from God is just a little extra special when we recognize that we're unworthy of that, and yet he saw us and loved us anyway, and we received his wonderful and amazing grace. And so thank you so much for singing this morning. Hey, kiddos, you are dismissed. Our Sprouts kids, our little Sprouts, those of you that are in kindergarten, you can go out this way with the good family. And uh, then all of our first, second, third, fourth graders, you can head out this door with Rylan and Emily. And so you're just going to have a great time, aren't you? Are you excited? I'm excited too. All right. So, uh, hey, kiddos, have a great service. See you later. That is awesome. So glad that you guys are with us today. Thank you so much for being a part of what God is doing uh, through the power of his word. Guests, thank you for being a part of our service. We're just honored to have you. It just thrills my heart to see how God has brought you to be with us today. And, and it's just a privilege to be able to minister to you. So, so let, let me share something about myself. And don't judge or make fun. Fair enough? Don't judge or make fun. Um, and you may like this as well. So you're, you're going to kind of know where I'm coming from. All right, ready? Um, believe it or not, I love watching the Food Network, 
all right? And what, what I mean by that, there are a couple of shows that I just enjoy watching. I love watching Beat Bobby Flay. How many of you have ever watched the Food Network, first of all? Raise your hand. Be honest. You watch the Food Network, all right? How many of you like the show Beat Bobby Flay? Raise your hand. Anybody watch that? Um, so here's how it works. There's this great chef. His name is Bobby Flay. He has his own restaurants across America, and he's just renowned. He's well known for his ability to cook. So the show works like this. Two contestants come on, and they go head to head uh, in creating a dish, and whoever wins that competition goes head to head with Bobby Flay, all right? There are judges there. They cook the same dish in their own style, and, uh, and, and so sometimes Bobby Flay wins. Most of the time he does, and then sometimes the contestant chef wins. The other show that I really like to watch is Chopped. How many of you have ever watched Chopped? I love watching Chopped because um, it's, just a, it's just a really cool show. Four chefs come together from some restaurant here uh, in America, maybe even overseas, and they compete head to head. Uh, the way it works is they come into this big kitchen, they're given a box, and when they open the box, there are ingredients in there and they don't have a clue what they are. They don't know ahead of, a ahead of time. And so they have to create a appetizer first and then somebody is chopped. So you get it? So now we're down to three, and then they have to create the main dish, and then somebody gets chopped, and we're down to two, and then they have to do the dessert, and then somebody is chopped, and we're down to th the winner of the particular episode. I love watching Chop. Now, um, I love watching the faces of the judges when they judge the food. I've, already, I've always thought, man, I would love to be a judge. I'd be like, yours is really good. Yours is really good as well. You know, I, I probably couldn't pick anybody. I just love food and I love to eat, and, uh, but I would love to be a judge on CHOP. And, and I like watching them as they put the food on their palate. But, but something that is often not noticed is the chef himself. The, the camera oftentimes will pan around to the chef as the chef is watching the judge taste his food or her food. And their facial expressions, their anticipation to watch how they respond to the flavors as they hit their palate. You can see the same anticipation as they're preparing the meals in the show. Obviously, it's all well done. There are cameras everywhere and, and different angles as the chef is chopping and, and adding spices to the blender or to the mixer. And they're, and they're cooking it up and then they're sampling it. They're tasting it, and they're putting more into the mix and then cooking it again or doing this and that. And it's just really interesting to watch the chef and to watch the chef's expression. Because if you're a real chef, your greatest desire, it's not necessarily to be number one, but your desire is that the person who is receiving the food loves it. And not only loves it, but desires to eat it and to enjoy it. With that in mind, with that illustration being given, it helps us to look into the heart of the Apostle Paul in chapter number three. As the Apostle Paul sends out Timothy to go be with the church at Thessalonica, and he so desires to build their faith. The essence of the chef preaching the Word of God and preparing the message to deliver it so that the listener would receive it and their faith would grow. Matter of fact, five times in this passage, Paul is going to reference the word faith as a result of them hearing the Word of God. And if you'll recognize in the passage, and I must plug myself in here as well, there is nothing, there is nothing that I desire more than the listener hear what God has to say and it tastes good spiritually, so much so that they desire it and long for it more and more. Notice what the text says. Open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. I want you to see something. Uh, the Bible says 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3 and verse number 1. 
wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we couldn't stand it any longer not being with you. And those of you that have come in to this message in this series, let me just take a brief moment to explain what's happening here. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17 goes to Thessalonica for the first time, and he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, and many people believe. But after only three weeks there, persecution begins to arise. Other people in the community are offended by their presence or bothered by their presence and want to kill Paul and Timothy and, 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 and wants to send them away to, to destroy them. And so Timothy and, and Paul and the team escape. And, and, and they run on into Macedonia and then head on into Athens. But Paul didn't want to leave, and his heart longed to be with them. And so he sends Timothy later to go back. And this is where we're going to pick up. This is what's happening in the passage. Notice here in verse number 1, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. I'm willing to be here alone so that you might get help. Look at verse 2. And sent Timotheus, Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and fellow labor in the gospel of Christ. Notice why he sends them. To establish you and to comfort you concerning your, what's the next word? Faith. Look at verse number five. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Look at verse 6. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity that ye be or that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us and we also to see you. Verse 7. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you all in our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, if you stand fast in the Lord. Look at verse number 10. Night and day, exceedingly, that we might see your faith and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Five times in this passage, as Paul writes this letter to the church, he helps them understand the importance of their faith. As a minister of the gospel, it's almost like a chef that that's heart is passionate about you enjoying what has been prepared and is passionate that you fall in love with what has been prepared. So does a minister of the gospel of grace. And Paul in the passage is simply saying this, my heart's desire is that your faith your faith should be strong. This is why we do what we do. Guys, please believe this. I am not doing this because I couldn't find anything better to do. But I've got to be totally honest with you. When I sit down and I begin to dig through the scriptures and I begin to try to understand what God is saying, my heart longs for you to feed on it. My heart longs for it to change you. My desire when I preach the word, and Paul says the same thing here, my, my heartbeat, my desire is that it might affect your faith. That you leave different than when you came. That life is different out there when the trials come than they were prior to hearing what God had for you. And I want you to see this in the passage, and I want you to know this morning how this minister in the passage, how his heart bleeds for this, and how this pastor's heart bleeds for this. Notice what the Bible says. I want us to go through this together. We're going to go through the whole chapter, but I want you to see how beautiful it is. He wanted their faith. He wanted their faith to be established, number one, this morning. Notice verse number two. And sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow labor in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. 
that, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Here's what Paul is saying. I'm sending Timothy to you, and he is going to come to you, and he's going to minister the gospel for this purpose. He wants to establish you, and he wants to comfort you. The word established in the text means this, to make stable, to place firmly, to be unmovable. And, and, and literally, this is why Timothy is being sent. This is why the man of God is standing amongst the people of Thessalonica, and this is why he's there, so that the people might be established, they might be stable. There's, there's a lot of people attending churches in America today, and you know this to be so, but there's not a lot of people that are stable. And that ought not to be so. The point of our faith is to establish us, to ground us, to make us firm in our walk with God. That's why I love the next word. Notice the next word. And to comfort you. Okay, okay. Um, this word is so self-serving sometimes. Well, I just come to church because I just need to be comforted. It's almost like we come here so the Lord and the preacher can just say, you're just a good old guy. You know, and, but that's not the point of the word comfort. The, literally, the, the definition in this text, in this moment, the Greek word, is the idea to come alongside for the purpose of strength. Have you ever been in one of those situations where you were anxious or nervous or broken or worried and someone walked into the room and it was like all that anxiety just ran out of your toes? Do you understand what I'm saying? You were like, I, I can't, oh, I'm so, I'm so glad you came. Okay, I can do this now. That is, that is literally what the text is saying. So Paul says this, I'm sending Timothy to you because I need your faith to be established. I need you to know that you're okay. I need you to recognize that you can do this. And I'm sending the minister alongside of you to establish you, to comfort you. Why? No, look at verse 3. That no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. But Paul is saying persecution's coming. I don't know what we're thinking. And again, refuting some of the preaching that's out there right now, the Christian life, Paul must be a liar. Watch this. Paul must be a liar or that preacher of that big church in Texas is a liar. Because one of them is saying that a good Christian won't struggle and he'll have health and wealth. And the apostle Paul says, we're appointed unto affliction. So someone is lying. Fair enough? And in this passage, Paul says to the church, it's coming, and here's what I need to know. I'm sending the minister to be with you, alongside of you, so that you might be established and that you might, okay, I'm okay. We can do this together. Guys, please understand that my heart is the same as this man's pa in this passage I love you. This is not a job to me. This is a life. This is a ministry. This is a calling. And I'm so glad, like Apostle Paul says, we've been appointed unto this. Now, just recently, Hurricane Sally ripped through the, the Gulf of Mexico, specifically really pounding Pensacola, Florida. We have many friends in Pensacola. Um, I was able to watch videos this week and to see pictures this week of what Sally actually did uh, there in Pensacola. Um, on campus at Pensacola Christian College, when you come onto campus, you have the sports center off to your right, and you drive on the campus, and then the next big building you see on your right is the dining hall. And between that is this long road that goes between the two, and there are these massive, humongous trees along that road. If any tree fell in any direction, it would have done great damage to a building. But I remember watching the video of the swirling wind and rain as, as Sally just parked in Pensacola for a little while and those trees standing firm, unmovable. Why? Why? Because they were grounded. Their roots sank deep into the ground. 
Then I saw other pictures of trees completely falling over, and you could see the, the circle of roots and the, the soil pulled up, and that's because the roots went across the surface. And here's what Paul is saying. The tribulation's coming. We've been appointed to this, but I'm sending the minister of God to you to help establish you, to teach your faith, to go deep into who God is, to comfort you. When people tell me this, hey, pastor, I just dealt with this, and I would, I would say this, why didn't you call me? Well, I didn't want to bug you. Don't ever do that. Please don't ever do that. Unless it's an ingrown toenail surgery, then I think you can handle that alone. <laughs> but if you're dealing with a sin and a heartache, and a struggle, and a difficulty, and you're sitting alone in the house, and you're needing some help, you need to understand that my calling and heart's desire is to walk in the room, and for some reason, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you get comfort, because together we establish each other. Do you understand the truth of that? That's a true minister of the gospel. And Paul said, I'm sending Timothy to you because I can't stand it any longer. It's what he's really saying. And, and I, I got to know that you're, in, you're doing what needs to be done. Our faith to be established. Number two, our faith to endure. Our faith to endure. Notice what he says in verse number four. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass. And you know, you, what he's saying is you saw it. You, you know what we've been through, what you've been through. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. Uh, look at the next line. Lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. He said, I couldn't wait any longer. I wanted to be sure you were established and comforted. And then he says it again, I couldn't wait any longer. I had to know if your faith was enduring. Now, let me ask you a question. Can my faith endure without the presence of a minister? Absolutely. My faith in Jesus Christ is between me and him alone. But God has set up this deal. And as a minister, I long to know. Paul said, I just want to know that all my investment that the gospel, that the work of the Holy Spirit is not in vain. You, I, I'm going to be very transparent in this message today. You do not know how it hurts my heart to know that the investment made in, of the gospel into your life was vain because some trial or some moment ripped you away from God. I don't want that to happen. I want you to be strong. I want you to be comforted. I want you to endure. And Paul is saying this, we're going to suffer. It's going to be difficult. But what I wanted to know is that your faith endured. Not your faith in the preacher. Not your faith in the movement. Not your faith in the church. But your faith in Christ endured. I don't want to see that in vain. None of us do. You can put your hope and faith and rest in Christ alone. And Paul wanted to know this. I love the statement that I read earlier. Faith includes the foundation of the body of doctrine and their believing response to God and living out that truth often with the help of someone else. I want you to know that what you believed endured. It endured. Notice what he says here to not be moved during afflictions. Notice verse 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we were appointed unto them. To, to not be moved when you suffer. For verily when we were with you, we told you that we would suffer tribulation. And, and that when the tempter comes, he, he doesn't tempt you to leave so that our labor be in vain. It's worth the battle so that you might endure. That's why coming together is important. That's why the preaching of God's Word is important. That's why attending and listening to the Word of God. You say, you're trying to build up your numbers. No, I'm trying to build your faith. That's what matters. 
That's what makes the difference. Through the, I, I'm, I feel like just conduit. You know what conduit is, right? I, I just feel like piping. I feel like a funnel sometimes in which God's word just pours through me so that you can run and run strong. I want to know that you're enduring. Notice what he says here as well. He says, I want your faith to be established, to endure, and then to be expressed. I love what he says here. Watch. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 now, verse 6. But now when, the, when Timotheus came from you unto us, so now he's been, he's stayed, and he's come back to Paul and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity and that ye have a good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. He said, I, I, I want your faith to be expressed. I want it to be lived out in such a manner that it is the essence of your testimony. When I come among you, we recognize that your faith is strong. It's one thing to go through a battle and recognize the battle. It's another thing to go through the battle and to be knocked out of the race. And Paul says this, when Timothy came back with the report and he told me how you were doing, he said, my heart leapt for joy. I can't tell you, I'm, I'm being so transparent this morning, not arrogant, but transparent. I cannot tell you the joy that I get when a young man calls my phone and says, hey, Brother Ray, you don't know me, but I heard you preach in my college and that's when I gave my life to the Lord. And now me and my family, we're 21, 22, 23, and we're serving Jesus Christ. To watch Jeremiah Teeman and Ruth pop onto the screen this morning as I was um, sending out a little encouragement today and to know that they're in a bus route today and they're serving Jesus after they were on drugs, after their marriage was in shambles, after they were addicted to meth, after their life was turned upside down. And to see them serving Jesus, there's nothing that does my heart any better than to see their family faith endure nothing there's no greater reward and church it is so important to recognize that that the minister comes so that your faith might be established and that it might endure and that they might hear of your testimony that your life is expressed in the way that you're loving jesus there's nothing like that. And Paul says, well, I, I wasn't even with you, but I heard, I heard, I heard how you're doing, and my heart is overwhelmed. Number four, to be an encouragement. We want your faith to be an encouragement, and you must see this. Look at verse seven. This is Paul speaking. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted. This is a different word, by the way. It's a different word. This actually means, yes, Wow, comforted. And we were comforted over you in our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Here's what he's saying. He is, he is literally saying, guys, we were helped while we were going through it because we knew that you were still faithful. I can't have, again, how many times I've sat in the desert and prayed. Lord, God, thank you so much for that family continuing and that one going. And Lord, I know I'm going through a hard time right now, but I can't quit because they're still going. And it's worth it to go through the trial. It's worth it to battle through. It's worth it to deal with the difficulty. It's worth it to go through the hardships of the ministry because we know that our labor is not in vain and that we've heard how they're doing and they're doing and what this is happening and we see your family getting stronger and, 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 we, and we get to see this young person giving his life to Christ and living holy. And because of that, it's like, okay, God, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's just worth it. That's what he's saying. I can go through the trials. I can face the tribulations. Why? Because I'm recognizing that you're standing fast. And so if you can do it, then this person can. Therefore, I can't quit. To watch you serve Jesus is the joy of continuing to give your families to Christ, to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to keep them faithful and holy, and then to recognize that another family is going to come along and they're going to need the same faithfulness. Man, there's just something special about that. 
That's why when Sunday school teachers show up to teach, they're not just kind of making stuff up for 45 minutes. They're longing for those little ones to really know Christ and for their faith to, to be strengthened and established and so that they might endure when they become teenagers and face this real world. That's why this matters. And just looking and seeing you continue on, we're like, okay, I'm going to keep on going. I don't know if you know this. I'm a part of several uh, pastoral groups on Facebook. There's one called the Ministry Connection. A lot of pastors across the country are part of that one. The Idea Network. A lot of pastors are part of that one. Different groups. And it is so sad to see how many pastors are committing suicide in our country today. There would be a plethora of reasons why that's happening. One meaning their own spiritual life probably has gotten off somewhere. Some action committed that brings so much guilt that they can't face those that stand before them. Some of them not recognizing the love of God, but some of them carrying the weight of the ministry, preaching weekend and week out seeing no change and no value in what's being done. Can I say I am so thankful? I'm not saying I can't get there. Take heed lest you fall. I just want you to know right now that I'm nowhere near there. Number one, my faith in Christ is really strong. My walk with my family is amazing. But you know what? I've got a church right now that I can sit in the desert in the dark times and go, God, I can keep on going because they're getting it and they're going. And this is what he's saying. I can endure the afflictions because of your faith. Notice the encouragement the church was to Paul. And then lastly here, I want you to see this. He says, I want your faith to be excellent. First Thessalonians chapter three and verse number nine. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Paul says, Here, here's, why, here's why we want to be with you. Here's why the minister is necessary, because I want to have a part in seeing the areas of your faith that lack be strengthened. None of us are perfect. Can I be transparent again with you? I believe it was Monday if I've got my days right. I'm having to make a choice on something that I am really, really struggling with. It has big time repercussions on both sides of the decision, and I am battling with this. And so finally, I come to a conclusion. I give my answer to those who need to know, and my spirit is grieved because of my answer. And so the next day, I send another message out, and I flip-flop, and I change my answer, and then my spirit once again is grieved. My faith is struggling in making the right decision on a big matter that, that carries a lot of weight for me, our church, our family. And so finally on Tuesday morning, if I'm not, or Tuesday afternoon, if I'm not mistaken, or Wednesday afternoon, I get on the phone and I contact five pastors, ministers of the gospel. And I get on the phone and I contact each of these guys. Hey, here's what I'm going through. Here's the struggle. Here's the reality. Please help me. And those men over the course of a couple of days established my faith and comforted me and those men knowing that my heart truly wanted to be in tune with God and to do what's right and not to please men and was able to guide and to lead in a particular decision and choice at that moment that I could not do myself so those guys had the ability to come into my life as ministers and to perfect my faith in a certain matter and this is what Paul is saying to the church. I am so glad that you are established and you endured and, and you expressed your faith and you've encouraged me by your stand. And, and I'm still praying, though, 
that God would make you excellent in your faith, that he would fill in the gaps, he would perfect you. The word perfect literally means, this is so funny, I know sometimes I alliterate my messages with the same letters. I just think it's a great tool as a way to minister. You don't have to do that, right? It's just my style. I love it. And I'm on the last point, and I get to the word perfect. I'm like, that's not an E word. And so I stick the word perfect in the thesaurus online. And you know what the first word is? Excellent. I'm like, that's an E word. <laughs> okay, I can preach now, right? And, uh, but it was just amazing because that is the right word. When I am perfect, I get to a point of excellence. And God wants our faith to be what? Excellent. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Without faith, it is impossible to what? Please God to put our faith and trust in the idea of faith, the essence of faith is this, Lord, I'm putting in you, I'm resting in you to do for me what I cannot do for myself. I'm going to say it again. Faith is believing in God to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And our faith must be strong and rooted in God. And where there are areas of weakness, my prayer as a pastor this morning at 6 o'clock in the desert on our property as I walked and paced my way around the property, God, grow their faith. Where they're weak, make them strong. Where they're weak, make them strong. God, fill me with your power this morning so that the words can go into their hearts and they can see the need of you. Lord, please. And this was Paul's prayer. He said this, I pray exceedingly day and night to see you, but not just see you, that, that, that your faith, wherever lacking, may be perfect. And I hope that you understand that that's the passion, the desire. And can I say this? If you're in a church where your faith is not growing, go to a new church. Or make sure your heart's right with God and you're listening and humble before Him. There's only two options. Because the minister should come alongside and his number one responsibility is to build your faith, to make you fall in love with Jesus a little more, to fill the gaps in. That's the purpose. Why? Big question. Don't you love the why? Why is this so important? And he, and he, and he answers the question in the text. Look at verse 11. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. Can you, I mean, again, can you just, if, anybody have an idea of what Paul really wants? He wants to be with the people. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love, one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. Even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. Again, why? Why? It's, it's kind of like this. My wife is a, is a great cook. I've watched her go to the kitchen and she'll head in there. She's got several good dishes that she makes and and, and she'll head in there, and she'll work, and she'll labor. And then, and then I'll hear this. Hey, hey, y'all, come on down. Dinner's ready. She wants us to eat it while it's still hot, ready to go. Yep. And then she gets frustrated. Come on, before it gets cold. And so the kids will come down, and they'll be all excited, and I'll come down, and, and we're just grabbing our plates. Oh, Mom, this smells good. It, it looks good. And some of them are not even saying any of that. They're just like, oh, let's go eat. You know, so they got their plate, and everything's nicely fixed, and we go sit down around the table. And I would say nine times out of ten, to my memory, this is what happens. We will pray. Bless our food, God. Thank you so much for uh, providing. Thank you for Mama fixing it. And, and we'll pray and we'll thank the Lord. And when we're done, all of us, the other six, will grab our forks and rah, into the food we go. We'll pull it up to our mouth. You know what Robin's doing? She's sitting there and she's watching. She's looking around the table. She's just looking. She doesn't necessarily want her back padded. She's not looking for praise. 
The heart of the mother just wants to know that what she's prepared is being enjoyed. I'm from the family, and we're in a family where you eat what you're given or you don't eat. We're living in a sad day with some children that dictate what mommy makes, and that needs to stop today. And I'm so thankful to sit around the table and have that child, whether they like it or not, look up at mom. Oh, mama, that is so good. Or, mom, it's all right. It's not my favorite, but thank you for making it. That's okay. I mean, how many of God's people really want to eat squash? You know what I mean? I mean, I do. I like good old southern squash cooked in bacon grease because bacon grease makes anything better. Amen. Right? But, you, you know, the, 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 just to watch your face. And, and then, you know, what, you know what the second thing is that makes mama feel good? It's when somebody says, well, nobody makes that like mama does. Unless you're recently married and then you kind of change that phrase. You know, guys, to be, uh, to, to be very honest with you, our great God has prepared a meal, and we're just chefs. We're just trying to lay it out so you can feed on it. For what purpose? The text says here to increase and abound in love. How many of you think Mama's been doing some good cooking lately? <laughs> I think I've increased a little bit since COVID. And that's not all her fault either. But God wants us to increase. He wants us to increase and abound in our love for people because of who we believe in and love for others because of who we believe in. It starts with the brothers. Hey, guys, we should be loving each other in this church. Our faith should be so strong in our Father that we are just passionate about the family of God, serving, loving, caring for, spending time together, making a difference among each other. But secondly, loving the world that's around us. Can I illustrate it this way? Uh, about a month ago, we, we went to the um, town city meeting, county meeting, and um, f uh, to try to support the Belco and their rest stop ministry downtown, uh, giving showers to homeless people and giving them water and clothing, etc. cetera, on, on Saturday mornings. And so when we sat down in there, you had all your city council members up there, and then you had a, a group of pe people here in the area and some in the lobby. COVID had us all spread out. But it was, it, was, it was interesting. Some people went to the mic and they said this, you know what, we need to love our community and do whatever it takes to show love. And you could tell, literally, I don't mean, I'm just not adding that a lot of these people were Christians and they said, hey, we just need to show love to our community and love to people and care for their needs. And then some would get up and they would say this, well, I don't want people stepping in my yard and dropping trash and, and I don't want this in my community because I don't want trash in my yard and I don't want my, my grass stepped on. So, so I'm sitting there and I'm listening to all this and trying to digest it. I'm not even trying to digest it in a way that is one-sided. I'm literally trying to digest it and think, well, what if it were me in this neighborhood that was inviting homeless people right into literally almost my backyard? I tried in my heart to justify their grass being trampled on in trash, being left outside but I couldn't get over thinking that I'm okay with my grass being trampled on and trash outside if somebody comes to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why? Why was my viewpoint different than some other's viewpoint on this matter? I live in a nice neighborhood, and people chunk out their McDonald's trash in my driveway. Literally. I don't get it. And so I'm sitting here thinking, well, the sun's going to kill your grass or the homeless guy can step on it and kill it. But you know what? If he comes to the knowledge of Jesus, how beautiful that is. I, I couldn't because why? Not because I'm special at all. Because I believe in Jesus and the gospel and the power of the gospel. So my love for mankind supersedes my frustration with trash. Does that make sense? One lady said, well, I'm scared for my children. I am too sometimes. I believe my children can be more rapidly rap, rip, ripped out of my hands in a Walmart, though, than they can in 
in a situation where homeless people were getting a shower. And I have faith enough to believe that God can take care of my children. Does that, and I'm not saying that I'm any more special, but I'm trying to prove a point. Here's what Paul is saying. He said, why should our faith be strong? Because we have to increase in our love for people in the church, but also our love for people outside of the church. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The beauty of that. You serve a Savior who loved you enough to step over boundaries to save you. That's amazing grace. And so as our faith is built, so is our love for God and others. Notice what he says here. And to the end, he may establish or establish your hearts unblameable in in holiness before God. This phrase means this. He says, I want to strengthen your heart to be unblameable in your walk, in your holiness with God, faithfully standing in what is right. I want you to stand in what is right. I want you to stand in what is right. In order to do that, your belief system's got to be strong. Period. Your faith has got to be strong. If you're going to stand in what is right, because a lot of stuff are going to come our way that we're not going to understand or even withstand if it weren't for the faith that we have in the Son of God. And I want you to be blameless. If our faith is strong, it means this, that the world can't toss dirt at us and it sticks because our faith is strong. Church, this is the passion that God has for us, that he's given to the minister to give to us so that our faith might be strong, so that we'll increase and be established faithful to him. What a beautiful thought. One of my, I hate referencing this all the time, but one of my favorite Andy Griffith episodes is the first one where the darlings come to town. You know, just, and so in that episode, Aunt B fixes a pot of beans for supper and they're sitting out on the front porch. And Aunt B looks over at Andy and says, how did you like the beans? And he said, well, I ate five bowls. She said, well, you didn't say anything. And he said, well, eating speaks louder than words. And then she makes a statement like, uh, I'm so glad you got a great education or something like that, I remember. So later they catch the darlings playing in a storefront and they invite the darlings to quit running around town and to, and to come and enjoy the beans that Aunt B made. And sure enough, same thing happens. Mr. Darling's sitting there and he's eating the beans and he gets all done and he eats his daughter's beans. And she said, did you like the beans? He said, well, I ate five bowls. She said, but you didn't say anything. Mr. Darling says, well, eating speaks louder than words. And she said, you told him to say that, didn't you? He said, no, that's a famous statement. You know, isn't that just like our faith? How do we know that our faith is being fed? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. He continues to consume the goodness of God and to grow in the greatness of God. And he doesn't have to say it. He just lives it and it's proven in his life. Hey, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And I'm just so thankful that he let me be a chef, Tyler. Aren't you? I'm so glad, hey, Amy's not in here. She was in the first service. I'm so glad that I get to take the word of God and and say, look, 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 Jason, this is good, stop. And he walked away going, oh, yes, God is good. And I'm gonna build my family on it. I'm gonna build my life on it. I'm gonna live it. That's that's what Paul is saying to the church at Thessalonica. Just, Just taste and see that God is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Father, we thank you that we could gather together today for the preaching of your word. Lord, what a joy it is to be able to give it. Lord, to reveal who you are and what you've done for each and every one of us and how you want to bless us and strengthen us so that we might endure. Lord, I pray, I pray, God, you would take your message and grow our faith. Help our faith to be so real that 
it endures, Lord. It, it's expressed in everything that we do, that it encourages others and even the minister. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see that more important than anything, we're, we need to be established, Lord, so that we can live blameless before you. And Lord, you've given us everything we need to know to make that happen. And what a joy it is to have it. Father, thank you for calling me to preach your word. I love it. I love being able to give out your truth. I love seeing lives change. I love seeing families strengthened, marriages made strong. I love seeing teenagers surrender their hearts and minds to Jesus. I love seeing people live pure lives and fighting off the devil. Lord, I love seeing them have victory and overcoming. Lord, it's just a, just a joy. My heart is so encouraged. And so, Lord, I pray that you continue to, to together use us for your honor and for your glory. And God, I pray that you'd continue to fill me with your spirit. Keep me safe. Protect me. Put a hedge about me. Lord, help me to remain humble to your leading and teaching and guiding so that I can faithfully do what you've called me to do. And we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory for what you accomplished. We love you so much. Thank you for first loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to just take a moment right now for you to have an opportunity to go to God and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you taught me. Thank you for truth. Thank you for the leading of God in my life. Thank you for your word. Thank you so much for your blessings to me. Help me to have a strong faith an enduring faith. Help my faith to make a difference in the lives of others. Help my faith to be established and not quickly knocked over. Lord, help me to be strong. If you're sitting here this morning and you don't have Jesus, meaning your faith is a little weak, you can't even say that heaven's your home, that you even know what's going to happen when you die. Today can be the day of salvation when you put your faith and rest and dependence in the Lord to, to, to completely trust and rest in Him above all else. You say, Pastor, I don't know for sure what's going to happen to me. My faith is weak in this area. I'm not sure if I'm saved. I'm not sure if my sins are forgiven. I don't know why God would even love me. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Is there anybody like that in the room? Pastor, pray for me. I'm, I'm just not sure about these things. I'm not sure. If today you need someone to pray with you and to encourage you, I'm available. Please let me know. As well as others here, a lady, if you need a lady, a man, if you need a man, we're here available. Just respond. Just let us know. We'll be glad to help. Father, we love you today. Thanks for letting us serve you. Thanks for giving us your word. Thanks for the church. Thanks for salvation. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stuart, would you come and bring some announcements? Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I actually showed up a little bit tired this morning, <laughs> but I can say I am leaving with way more energy, and that's not just because Pastor Ray's energy is so contagious or your smiling faces. It is because of the Word of God. It is the power of His Word, and it is the grace that I've received today. So I hope you leave with that blessing as well today. Um, we have plenty of opportunities to gather around the Word of God this week. Uh, Juana started back up last week, and it went really well. Uh, Tuesday nights, 9th through 12th grade, is our journey. Um, Awana's with Tyler, so if you have any questions, see him. And then for everybody else, that's Wednesday night at 6.30, and you can see Ed Angel if you have questions about that. Uh, starting points, that started, and it's going really well. Um, but you can jump in anytime you want. So if you would like to join the church or you just have more questions about the church, join starting points. And that happens during our connection classes. So one of the challenges of having two services is that we might miss each other in passing. Uh, connection class is a great chance for us to reconnect and to not miss each other in passing. So those people who showed up at the first service, if you show up to connection class, you might see some of them. And um, that is going well also. Uh, join us for life groups. If you haven't signed up for life groups, we've got life groups on Wednesday nights after, during Awana and then on Thursday nights as well. And then we also have a, have a virtual life group if you can't make it out to either of those. 
And the one that I am really excited about is this coming Saturday. Is that right? Two weeks, October 3rd. Oh, okay. My notes say this coming Saturday. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited about it either way. I wish we could have this every Saturday. It is men's prayer breakfast. And that'll be 7 a.m. on the church property. Unlimited bacon and sausage, which is not on my notes, but Pastor Ray is committed to that. Um, so come up to Men's Prayer Breakfast. We'll be at the new property. I'm excited about going out to that. I'm going to make a change. Okay. Um, I did a little conflict right now, and I'm going to go back with my original. It is going to be this Saturday at 7 o'clock, Men's Prayer Breakfast. Um, we have a youth conference away on the 3rd. And so I want to be here and be a part of it. So this Saturday is, so we're giving you everything you want. It's all about you. All right. <laughs> so this Saturday, executive decision right here. This Saturday, men's prayer breakfast, and we're definitely getting unlimited bacon and sausage because of that. And then the youth conference uh, coming up October 17th. Okay, yeah, and then that one, um, parents are welcome to come to that and encouraged to come to that um, because there will be se sessions for parents during that time. So that's October 17th. If you have questions, you can talk to Tyler about that. So thank you guys for coming. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for our time together today around your word. We pray for your continued guidance that you would direct our paths to those people uh, that need your love. We ask that you would increase and make us abound in love toward one another and toward all men. We ask, Father, that you would establish our hearts unblameable in holiness before you until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, and to him we give glory. Amen. Amen. Offering plates are at the back and the sides on your way out. Thank you.